go ahead and start um, our event. Thank you again for your patience. Dr. Adeka was just coming from prayers this afternoon, so he needed to, um, to finish a couple of things and, and get, get situated before we started today. So we're excited to welcome two important guests today, Dr. Muhammad Ibn Umar Adeka, who's a, um, and also retired U.S. Ambassador Dan Mozina. Um, this event today is hosted by the Africa Research Cluster, um, which is here at the School of International Service at American University. We host speakers throughout the year on themes of African politics and also African culture and society more broadly. And I'm passing around a sign-up sheet, so if you haven't gotten that, if you could please sign up on that so we can make sure to add you to our list <coughs> so that you know about um, upcoming events. And um, our next uh, event, shameless plug, is actually for my book launch, um, which is on November 5th. And so it's a book about, it's called 10 Big Bird Fight Terrorism, uh, Children's Television and Globalized Multicultural Education. It's a book about the Nigerian version of Sesame Street. So it's also on the same themes of Nigeria and Boko Haram, uh, but looking at kind of how the US government has used Sesame Street as a tool of soft power in Nigeria um, to try to build peace there. And so that's on November 5th at 5.30 p.m. And we'll send it out via the listserv as well. It's in the founder's room at the, in the SIS building. So we'd love to see you there as well. Um, and then we have another uh, event with Patricia Agupusi, who was here a moment ago, um, who also writes about um, Nigeria, actually. So we have a lot of Nigeria focus coming up, um, and that'll be on November 14th, uh, coming up as well. Um, so to introduce our speakers today, um, Dr. Adeka is a professor at the Nigerian Defense Academy in Kaduna, Nigeria. He's a former brigadier general in the Nigerian army and a security expert in Nigeria. And he's written a book about Boko Haram, the insurgency, um, which is titled Nigeria at Crossroads in the Doldrums, Boko Haram, a false flag operation. So today he's going to be talking to us about the failure of the current Buhari administration um, to quell the Boko Haram uprising in Northeast Nigeria and in the Lake Chad Basin more broadly. Um, and uh, this insurgency has killed uh, thousands and displaced millions. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, Dr. Adeka actually witnessed many attacks by Boko Haram, um, especially the one on October 1st, 2010. Uh, which was Golden Jubilee Day, which is Nigeria's Independence Day, uh, when he was in he was in charge at the time of the surveillance in Abuja, uh, for the the capital city of Nigeria, and uh, he was in charge of of surveillance of Abuja from October 2010 until January 2016, um, during which there were of course many attacks by Boko Haram, but especially um, the one I just mentioned um, in Eagle Square in Abuja and another one in, a, in Abuja as well, which was in the Mogadishu cantonment, which is uh, where there are many military barracks in, uh, in Abuja. And so during the time, this time he was also the acting chief of staff at the headquarters of the Nigerian Army Intelligence Corps. Um, his specialties are uh, cryptography and cybersecurity at the Department of Intelligence and Cybersecurity at the Nigerian Defense Academy in Kaduna, as I mentioned. Um, and the Ambassador Dan Mozima is here uh, with us today. I'm very happy to welcome him. He worked for the U.S. Foreign Service for 38 years before his retirement just earlier this year. Um, ambassador Mozima, among his many roles, he served as ambassador to Angola from 2007 to 2010 and as ambassador, ambassador to Bangladesh from 2011 to 2014. And most relevant to today's event, uh, he served as the State Department's first senior advisor, senior coordinator, I should say, on Boko Haram. Um, and later, it's, it's offshoot ISIS, ISIS West Africa, which we'll talk about in a moment as well. So in this capacity, he advocated filling in behind the military successes uh, with civilian security and civil administration to restore security and stability to the region, establish rule of law and effective governance, and promote economic development and job creation to address the drivers of the conflict in the Lake Chad uh, region and try to break that cycle of violence. So I want to give a very brief background on Boko Haram. For those of you who might be um, less familiar with the conflict there, I'm just going to say a few of the kind of main statistics um, of the conflict. So in northeast Nigeria and the, the Lake Chad region uh, more broadly, continuing attacks uh, from both Boko Haram and its splinter group, Islamic State West Africa, have destabilized the region for about a decade now. Um, the group, although this is somewhat debated, whose name means Western education is forbidden, um, is, the, is the name of the meaning of the name Boko Haram. 
uh, gained international infamy in 2014 for kidnapping almost 300 girls in Chibok, Nigeria. That's probably the case that many of us are the most familiar with. Um, and this kidnapping, while horrific, represents only a small fraction of their activities. Uh, since 2009, Boko Haram has attacked churches, marketplaces, bus stations, and police stations, and has continued kidnappings at schools, most recently in 2018, of 110 girls in February 2018. Um, in the ongoing conflict, over 2.7 million people have been displaced into the broader region. Uh, 4,000 girls and women have been abducted, and about 1,500 schools have been forced to close leaving approximately 2.9 million children without access to education. Uh, in the region, more than 7.1 million people have been declared securely food insecure, so there's major issues of starvation across the region now. Um, and while statistics on this are very hard to gauge, approximately 30,000 people have been killed in the conflict in the last 10 years. Uh, the Nigerian government has been uh, critiqued for human rights violation in their responses to Boko Haram, um, where they've jailed and killed many suspected Boko Haram members without uh, trial or without proper judicial um, procedures. And uh, the president, Muhammadu Buhari, who's been in power since 2015, he's claimed to have technically defeated Boko Haram um, and the military activities have reclaimed significant territory in Northeast Nigeria, but attacks continue and much remains to be done. Um, to gain stability. So, and I'm sure you'll be learning much more in, in much more detail and from people who know much more about, about this conflict um, today. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Adeka now for a to, to talk about 30, 40 minutes about um, his experiences and, and his theories about the situation. And then Doc, uh, Ambassador Mozina will respond for about 15 minutes and then we'll open up to questions from you. So thank you so much. I hope the screen is clear. Yeah. I can see the screen well see. from here. Uh, <coughs> good evening, uh, Ambassador Mozina, and uh, the organizers from the School of uh, SIS, uh, members of the audience, thank you for coming. Well, I don't see this as an academic work at all. I see this, my work, as a contribution to human security, starting from Nigeria, and hopefully using Nigeria as a case study for the rest of humanity to benefit. But I discovered that uh, there is uh, a lot of things that people know, which we pretend we don't know, and so, not just Nigeria, the war against terrorism, but all over the world is shrouded with a lot of hypocrisy. First of all, the definition of Boko Haram, like the professor has given, is what is in the internet. That is not the meaning of Boko Haram. That is not the meaning of Boko Haram because that definition presupposes that the word Boko derived from book as its later understood after the colonization of Africa, or Nigeria in particular, and the establishment of Western education. But the word Boko has an origin, as we will see later uh, in this presentation. This is a concise summary, actually, previewing this book, which is going to be about 755 pages. It ought to have been ready, but hopefully, because of some financial crisis here and there. Uh, it is not ready today, but it has been printed. Few things remain. As soon as it's available, we'll try to make it uh, available. Oh, the title, I hope, is clear there. We we'll have the uh, cover sheet, and then you have the, the, the back cover. If you look at the front cover carefully, you see Nigeria at crossroads in the doldrum of Boko Haram, a first flag operation. Uh, if you look at the diagram, clearly you see some people with rifle. At the bottom, you see some label in there, um, uh, Baelsa and the Delta State Government Houses, and then dovetailing to uh, Asorok. Asorok is a presidential villa in Nigeria. And then you see some arrows getting out of that diagram, going up and going sideways. 
uh -huh. this presupposes the areas where Boko Haram have been incubated and nurtured. And then, of course, it takes two to tango. You must have linkage to outside world where you come to terrorism. This is from the 26th American president, that only he can become a good citizen who remains true to the heritage of his native land. Part of this effort is that terrorism is not part of Africa, not just Nigeria. It's not part of Africa. What is part of Africa is that African heritage is a simple life of peacefulness, good neighborliness, and hospitality. It is neither anything that has to do with terrorism, the counter terrorism. So we pray that this little effort will inform the people to wriggle Africa, and particularly Nigeria, out of this quagmire. There is a reason you separate military and the police. Why? Because one fights the enemies of the state, while the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, then the enemies of the state tend to become the people. So if you are looking for uh, those perpetrating Boko Haram, you must have to look inward rather than looking outward in Nigeria, from Nigeria. The presentation outline will consist of the following. We'll briefly highlight uh, on Nigerians, history just brief highlights, then the origin of terrorism in Nigeria, where we think it came from, and then OSS has to do with uh, Ogoni Secret Society, ROFC, Reform Ogoni Fraternity of the Christians, and ROF, the same thing without C, and they can, Christian Association of Nigeria. Then you have the major insurrections in Nigeria in brief, the recession campaigns in Nigeria, modern terrorism in Nigeria, the Metusine crisis, and Boko Haram terrorism in Nigeria, insecurity in Nigeria from 2000 to 2015, with backward extrapolation up to 1966 and forward extrapolation to date. Summary of major guiding indicators and the conclusions and the way forward for Nigeria and the global community. I remember when I was doing my master's at the Rochester Institute of Technology from 1991 to 1993, Rochester, New York, I had a reason to go with this one of the prison for humanitarian service. And one of the questions I was asked was that Africa and Nigeria, which one was bigger? So for this reason, I decided to present to this audience the difference between Africa and Nigeria. Nigeria is just one out of about 53 countries in Africa. Nigeria is rented the rate, uh, as you are seen there, at the trigger of Africa, as it's normally called. Brief highlights on Nigeria. Nigeria was a British colony for about 100 years, from 1861 to 1st October 1960, when it got its independence. It's an oil-rich country from 1959 to date. It is highly endowed with human and other natural resources, especially solid mineral wealth, which will have net less than 34 in 450 different locations and agriculture. Political interregna characterized by military coups and counter coups, not less than nine, actually more than nine. So not less than nine since the independence in 1960. Now in the Fourth Republic, a civil war and a secessionist agitation and uh, insurgencies. It has also witnessed a lot of political development and democratic innovations from being a parliamentary system in 1960 uh, at independence, it changed to a presidential system after the American Constitution in 1979 to date. Uh, periods of economic booms were also there, particularly the, the, during the era of General Yakub Gawon. Uh, then you also have periods of austerity measures, like the period of uh, General uh, Ibrahim Babangida. And uh, also, we have recessions, which was not only really peculiar to Nigeria, but other parts of the world. Origin of terrorism in Nigeria. In my work, which is an award-winning paper in uh, at Armed Forces Commander Staff College in 2000, I tried to trace the origin of terrorism from African base. And what I could get was that it was as a result of practices by secret courts. 
The best known of these secret courts was the Ogoni Secret Society, which was prevalent in the old Oyo Empire, which existed from the 12th to 18th century. Ogoni Secret Society became reform, and they call it the Reform Ogoni Fraternity of the Christians, which goes by the uh, uh, Yoruba uh, description that Egbe Ogoni Onibabo, that the Reform Ogoni Fraternity of the Christians, uh, with its membership published in 1989. ROFC drew its membership from all religions, regions, ethnicities, and uh, all walks of life. Origin of terrorism in Nigeria continue. The activities of urban secret societies such as human rituals, cannibalism, and nocturnal meetings sacred, uh, and, uh, secured away no members. It was therefore reformed on 18 December 1914 to do away with some of these traditional practices and uh, infuse some Christian principles into it. The Ogoni Security Society was reformed to infuse some Christian principles into it, which gave rise to the word ROF, Reform Ogoni Fraternity. It later opened its door to other faithfuls. It was originally meant to cement truthful truthfulness, love, and sincerity among its members. The Reform Ogboni Fraternity remained a secret call until 1984, when it published the names of its uh, trustees and the revised constitution. It went further to publish the names, addresses, addresses and the telephone numbers of its members in 1989. The ROF, Reform Ogboni Fraternity, is the local version of Freemasonry in which the Queen of England and the Duke of Edinburgh are uh, members. In fact, the Queen herself was initiated into the ROF in 1956 when she came to Nigeria. Uh, the background work of the award winning paper is this paper here, the Countering Terrorism in Nigeria in 2000, which I wrote bearing in mind the terrorist activities in the Niger Delta, and I felt that terrorism will be part of our problem in the next future, near future. It won the Chief of Army Staff Award. Origin of terrorism in Nigeria continued. Now, what we are seeing here is that we have a completely secret society whose activity is very terroristic. Now, some members say it should now be reformed to infuse Christian ideas. Now, if it was purely a Christian organization, its membership, as we will see later on, uh, will have been different because. When the members were published, like Chief Obafemba Olowo, who was a Yoruba chief from the Southwest, was not a member. But the late Sardona Osokoto was a member. Dr. Namida Azikwe was a member. Therefore, the ROF is not a religious organization completely. It is a fraternity that members wanted to advance their causes, whatever those causes will be. So, you remember that when the Ogboni Fraternity was reformed, it was the Ogboni Fraternity of the Christians. Later, the word Christian was removed and it remained ROF. Now, with members from other parts of the country, and Muslims in particular, they could not continue with some of the objectives which were still nocturnal in nature. So it died naturally, and later they now restored to the the former name of uh, Reform of Bonnie Fraternity of the Christian, which means non-Christian members will no longer be members. Therefore, the so non-Christian will no longer be members. And they now change the name to Khan. So what I am telling you now is from the activities of Khan, which we saw, and as we'll see later on, it is an offshoot of the Reform of Bonnie Fraternity. Uh, Major insurrections in Nigeria, as we will see later on, a professor, Professor Dauda Ojobi, explained how Metetsine was engineered by the Christian Association of Nigeria in 1954. While he was a Christian, I was the secretary taking their meeting in Jos, Plateau State then. And as we we'll also see later, we will see the relationship between the Metetsine riot and Boko Haram. Major insurrections in Nigeria will include the Abba Umerayos, the political unrest in the Southwest in the 1962, 
and the other crises thereafter, for military coups and counter coups up to 14 or thereabout, and uh, few other ones in between, which may not need to be mentioned here. Now, modern terrorism in, uh, in Nigeria, the Metisine movement in Kano and many parts of northern Nigeria in the 1980s was a terrorist organization along the same pattern with the Boko Haram terrorism to which it gave birth. Terroristic attacks were also clearly discernible in the activities of both the OPC, uh, Odua People's Congress, and the conglomerate of Ijo militant youths <coughs> under the name of uh, Niger Delta militants that are grouped under MEN, that is Movement for the Emancipation of Niger Delta. About the interchange between the previous and the current millennia. In other words, towards the end of the last millennium, and the beginning of this millennium, there were so many terrorist activities in the Niger Delta. The, their own case was not religious per se, they were fighting for resource control. Apart from the above, other isolated cases may exist, like the case of hijacking an aircraft from Nigeria to Niger in the 1992 by the Movement for the Advancement of Democracy, and one or two other cases of hi hijacks. Now, what is Boko Haram? And this is the most important question in this presentation and the most important assignment that those who are interested in ending Boko Haram should know. The, question, the answer you will get to this question is that Boko Haram means Western education is prohibited. The first place why this is, cannot be is that the, the Boko Haram leaders themselves did not give themselves these names. People give them this name. Their name is Jemaat Ahle Sunnah, the Dawat Wali Jihad, that a group of people committed uh, to the Sunnah of the Prophet and Propagation and Jihad. Now, if we say Boko Haram means Western education is prohibited, that in Islam, the word Haram is not a loose terminology. You cannot say something is Haram unless God has specifically banned that thing. And you must have a reference where God banned that thing usually from the Quran or Holy Hadith, not even the Prophet. If the Prophet prohibits a thing, you will use another form of prohibition which is less uh, strong compared to Haram. So since there's no way in the Quran where any form of education is prohibited, then Western education is prohibited has no basis as the meaning of Boko Haram. Uh, it is interesting for me to relate quickly a story. In, um, in uh, 2012, when I was a PhD candidate, in the uh, UK, a traditional ruler, prominent traditional ruler, whom I believe the president specifically asked him to find out my thoughts of Boko Haram, because they felt my view were critical. When I was serving, they removed me from the table. I told them on the 1st of October that the bomb that went off in Abuja was the plan from Asorok. And I gave them the name of the general who supervised it. I told them the bomb that went off on the 31st of December, 2002. 10, at the, that is the first uh, attack in the military bar, Mogadishu Katumbel in Abuja. I told them it was planned from NSA's office. And I gave them the name of the officer who supervised it. So they removed me from intelligence uh, desk. So, when I now ran, after surviving two assassination attacks, I went on self exile so My PhD was actually a self exile under the cover of PhD. So when I was there, this traditional ruler, Ask me what my thoughts were on Boko Haram. I told you it's not just the one answer. He said, okay, he was going to come to London. Uh, could I do him a paper? I said, fine, I could do a paper. So I did him a 24-page paper. And on the 19th of June, 2012, we met in a hotel in London. So he told me to give him the summary. I said, sir, the problem is that uh, uh, Boko Haram is not the meaning we are giving to it. He said, but how can I say so? The man was an house man. I am not an house but I speak house sir. How could I say so? Boko Haram means, uh, uh, what's the name of the Haram? I said, no, sir. Are you saying that the word Boko has no meaning in house Before the coming of the colonial master. Because the colonial master first conquered us, then he brought in Western education. But before then, the word Boko has the meaning. But he didn't want to go to that again. I said, son, let me now ask you a question. If Boko Haram means Western education is prohibited, like the Metisina used to say, then why is this that 
I said, sir, we are talking today on the 19th of June, 2012. Go and check your records. The Boko Haram have never attacked any Western educational facility anywhere in Nigeria. If they meant that Boko Haram, well, Western education was Haram, they should have started the attack from there. Why is this not so? He was defeated. He kept quiet. My greatest surprise, sir. After about three weeks, when they returned to Nigeria, they started attacking Western education institutions. Starting from the most historical uh, secondary school in northern Nigeria, the Barua College. They burned down their library completely. And from there, it was attacked from one school to the other. One school to the other. I say, God, if I had known, I would not have posed this question to this man. Because obviously, he went back and told them, and they couldn't stand the challenge. So in order to convince or confuse the world, they have to start, take, they have to start attacking a, a Western educational institution. So Dr. Tilde, on the authority of Professor Mahdi, was the former vice chancellor, gave the meaning of Boko. The word boko simply means fake, fraud, fraudulent, adulterated, non-genuine. And it was used before the colonial master. The most prominent usage was the description of a bride. When the bride was going to be carried to the husband's house, they would carry the actual bride secretly. After they have carried the bride secretly, then the fake bride, which they call Amerian boko, would ride on the horse with pope and pageantry, with people, uh, with, uh, who people will escort to the husband's house. So that is the original use of Boko. So when Western education came, the Islamic scholars didn't want their students or people to be taken away. So they decided to give a bad name to a bad dog. Uh, well, give a bad name to a dog in order to hang it. So they now call Western education Makarantamboko, uh, which means fake education. That's what it actually means. It has nothing to do with haram, Islamically speaking, culturally speaking. So, like I say, Boko Haram is a code word. So I told the traditional ruler that our first responsibility is to decode it. If we decode it correctly, we are on the path to finding a solution. But as long as we can decode it, we will continue to grow in the darkness. I ask a question. Boko Haram apparently had the ability to strike anywhere in Nigeria. Why is this that is restricted to the north? All the Boko Haram mayhem were restricted to the north. They could come to the south. Why didn't they go there? Then I gave him a detailed work that the name Boko Haram, or the code word Boko Haram, was crafted around 2000 by a political ruler who had military background. The objective was the man wanted to be a life president. So what, how was he going to do it? He wanted to destabilize the North, disorient the North, and the disorganize the Muslims, so that they would not even be thinking of, thinking of capture, recapturing the presidency from the South. Therefore, the Northern part that had no um, um, militant youth, because there were militant youth in the Southwest, the Odua People's Congress and the various uh, militant groups in the South South uh, gathered under the MEND, uh, and, uh, the movement for the emancipation of Niger Delta. The North they didn't have. So they had this small group that was already coming, which is actually a remnant or a resurgence of Mithisine. As we've seen there, the father of Muhammad Yusuf, who is the leader of Boko Haram, was killed in the company of Mithisine in 1980. His grandfather ran away with him to the northeast. So when they reestablished and came back, then Modu Sharif, the governor of Borno State, working as a front for that political leader, now went into an alliance with Boko Haram for his political uh, objective and that of his master. Now, they gave uh, Boko Haram a slot, a political slot. They created a Ministry of Religious Affairs and gave, it, uh, gave them the slot for commissioner, which was occupied by Alaji, uh, Alaji Foy. Now, they had a misunderstanding which led to the extrajudicial killing of uh, Muhammad Yusuf, as we already know. Now, the, 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 the commissioner for uh, religious affairs wanted to find out, we had an agreement with you. What is happening? How could Muhammad have been arrested by the military, handed over to the police, 
And then the next thing is to hear that he's dead. So he was similarly killed extrajudicially. The grandfather of Muhammad Yusuf, who didn't know what happened, wanted to go and find out. He was similarly killed. In other words, Muhammad Yusuf was killed on the 29th of uh, 29th, 30th, the 30th of July, uh, 2009. Uh, the uh, Commissioner for Religious Affairs, Fai, was killed on the 31st of July. The grandfather of Muhammad Yusuf was either killed on the 31st or on the 1st of August. So, we can say that Boko Haram is a direct offshoot of Metisini with the same personality, same objective, but certain strategies have to be modernized because of change of time. So, that is for the definition of Boko Haram. Now, this thing, is, this uh, uh, elaboration is given in, a, in an article uh, written by Dr. Umbadu Tilde, which I gave the, I think I gave the link there, when you can read details about it. Now, insecurity in Nigeria from 2015, with backward and forward uh, ex extrapolations. Now, this is dealing with the main book. The book focuses on occurrences between 2000 and 2015. Uh, it's actually three books in one. Book one has volumes one and two. Volume one deals with the analysis of the issues. The high point of, vol of volume one is deplored by the governors of Delta State and the Bayesa State uh, to be stealing military weapons from military arsenal in Kaduna and the Jaji. They spent hundreds of millions of naira between 2000 and, the 2000 and, and December 2007. In other words, for as long as Obasanjo was in power, the general officer commanding the one division in Kaduna was always coming from the south-south or from neighboring states. And the president was approving it. And this stealing continued. Until Yaradua took over in 2007, after about four months, that it was discovered. When it was discovered, the military had about, about seven soldiers were involved. Then a younger officer, well, a junior officer, the rank of major, was also involved. And there about two generals, major generals, were involved. And then the DGSS, that was a retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel from Nigerian Intelligence Corps, was also involved. They were either actively facilitating this or covering up the matter. So, Yaradu were having the rule of law as a main a cardinal uh, uh, policy of his government, went straight away to deal with those perpetrators. The soldiers were tried together with the junior officer. They were found guilty, and they are serving life jail till now. Now, what happened to the general? Because in military law, when an offense is jointly committed, it should be jointly tried. So the general knew that uh, the next thing is for them, for Yaradu to take on them. So they, like I told you, the, the governors of Bayesa included President Gulag Jonathan, who was now uh, the vice president. So they knew it would be their turn. Yaradu would not leave any of them. So the circumstances leading to the death of Yaradu are required to be probed. If a sitting president die, his death should be probed. If he's not probed, we are covering up certain things. So, book, book one makes the analysis. A complete uh, intelligence report, 36 that page report, is attached to the end of this volume one, in the first document there. Then, volume two of book one is a just attachments of documentary evidences for the discussions in volume one. Then, book two is a catalog of crimes versus alleged criminals for possible prosecution by the ICC. Then book three is the action and reaction between the author and the government, which led to the cancellation of my PhD program. But in the process, I prevented a coup because they had no plan to do the election in 2014, which they postponed one. Then on discovering that the plan was that if uh, President Buhari was leading irreversibly, they will stage a palace coup, which was supposed to take place on the 31st of March, 2000 and, uh, 2014. Now, because of my interactions, they discovered that I was monitoring them. I was following their meeting. So the night that they were, sorry, the day that they were supposed to have their final coordination meeting, I sent them a copy of this letter to the ICC, 
to the chief of army staff, to the chief of defense staff. The meeting by 10 o'clock was frustrated. It was there the president directed my, my, my PhD scholarship, which was being sponsored by the Petroleum Development uh, 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 PTDF, should be canceled. Now, book three contained those actions and reaction. Now, backward and forward extrapolation. Now, if we look at certain issues, a nation cannot move forward where punishments uh, why crimes are not punished and uh, good jobs are rewarded. We have not been punishing people. Criminals have been committing crime and uh, they go unpunished. The plotters of the January uh, 15, that is the have not been tried at all. They have not been tried. Now, they have not been tried as soon as the general Agu Iransi took over, he proscribed Jamaat Nasser al-Islam, which is the equivalent of Khan. Now, if Khan was a religious organization and uh, uh, at par with Jamaat Nasser al-Islam, there is no way you proscribe Khan, I mean, uh, Jamaat Nasser al-Islam without proscribing Khan. So, that is worse. The northern leaders kept quiet and stomached it. Then General Gowan took over after the counter coup of 1966 as well. 1966 as well. Uh, he maintained the proscription, and that proscription was retained until 2012. Actually, it was never deproscribed. The Jamaat Nasser was just re-registered. Now, Khan is Khan a religious organization, or is Khan a fraternity that is seen itself as opposition to Islam? Just like many Muslims see the Western world as being anti-Islam. That many Muslims see the Western world as being anti-Islam. Many people don't believe that September 11 was done by Al-Qaeda. They believe some more powerful people either did it on their own or they aided Al-Qaeda to do it. They didn't believe that Al-Qaeda had the capacity to do those things in the United States. Why should it be done, it should be done so that excuses should be provided to attack Muslim nations? So this creates the friction. So, and that is the impression that Khan, which is supposed to be a religious organization, uh, is supposed to ameliorate. Unfortunately, it is aggravating it, presenting a situation where from 1954, they planned to send Christians to go and study Islam in Sudan so that they will come and misinterpret the Quran among the Muslim populations in, in northern Nigeria and Niger. Unfortunately, most of, not many of the Muslims have patience to see the Quran either being mutilated or being misinterpreted. They knew the reaction will be fiery, and that is what they got. So, Metisine caused mayhem in northern Nigeria, while three of the people sent to Sudan, after five, refused to come back and embrace Islam. So, in a nutshell, go on, General Agui Ronsi were not portraying themselves as national leaders. They portrayed themselves as leaders for the Christians. At the same time, General Yakubu Gowon attempted to proscribe Hajj. Hajj that Muslims have been going from time immemorial. He wanted to proscribe it. Now, on discovering that it was not possible, then he invented a Jerusalem pilgrimage for the Christians. Now, so what, the way people look at it from the Nigerian point of view is that is Khan representing the interests of Christians? Is Christian a religion or a fraternity? Or is Christian, uh, 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 Christianity teaching Christians to worship God for the good of the hereafter? And of course, starting from this world, or is it, are they being trained to see themselves as opposition to Islam? These things are conflicting, and the action of these two leaders, General Yaqub Gawon and General Iran Sim, seem to leave a lot to be deserved. Now, in the coup of 1975, it was a palace coup. When the Minister of Defense is part of the coup plotter, it's a palace coup. And when you organize a coup plot in the palace, the commander of the palace ought to have questions to answer. And who was that commander of the palace? It was General Lushego Basanjo, who ran away after the coup. Insiders knew that Obasanjo had an uh, uh, information about that coup. And from other privileged intelligence channels, he was actually the mastermind of that coup. Now, he has not to stop. There are so many other allegations of uh, political assassination up to this moment. Even the current president was attempted. And uh, we knew what happened. He survived by whiskers, by miracle. So if people continue to commit crime, 
and they are not punished, there is no way insecurity will go away. Now, the assassination of General Abacha and Chief Abiola is another thing. Obasanjo was in prison. So, Abacha had to die for Obasanjo to come out. Now, if Abacha dies, Obasanjo comes out, Obasanjo wants to become president again. But Abiola with the June 12 campaign, being alive, no Yoruba man will have a chance to go at the president. So Abiola also had to die. So these two deaths need to be properly probed. Now, backward integration, I mean uh, ext extrapolation, various political murder and the effort to block Meta President from access to information to date. General Buhari, to the best of my understanding, is one of the best human beings on the surface of the earth today. I have never worked with him, but I have a privilege of having my cosmate, my military cosmate, been attached to him when he was detained by General, uh, General, General Badamasi uh, Babangida uh, for about three years in Akure. I was in Ileife then, a student, and between Akure and Ileife is just about one hour drive. I had that the inner understanding of the personality of that man. I don't think we in Nigeria, for example, can find another man like that man. However, Buhari alone cannot do it. Buhari can't carry weapon to go and fight Boko Haram. The military chiefs, what they have discovered is that Buhari has zero tolerance for corruption. Therefore, it should be blocked from getting current information about happening. It happened to me. When I was in the United Kingdom, the Minister of Defense invited me to chair an investigation relating to Boko Haram in the Northeast. So I came. As soon as I came, the current leadership of the military were either my immediate senior or my immediate junior, and they knew my personality. So they discovered it was not going to work. They, they lobbied the, the, the minister to remove it. The minister said, no, the president wanted to know the truth. And the minister himself, who didn't know me, his investigation revealed that it was only I that could do it at that time. So he wanted him to do it. So what the military leaders did, four of them, the chief of army staff, chief of air staff, chief of naval staff, and the chief of defense, but teamed up and came and intimidated Mr. Uh, the, 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 the minister of defense to remove me. If they don't remove me, they will not have anything to do with this investigation. Immediately, they left the minister's office. They called the theater commander from northeast to Abuja and told him if any member of my committee went to that place, they should be killed and labeled as Boko Haram casualty. So I told the minister I could conduct two forms of investigation. What to do an open investigation, which has been blocked, or we'll do a discreet one which might even be better because if we went there openly, the boys in the field will give us what their godfather asked them to give us. But with this script, we buy information the way we want it. So I sat down and wrote a discreet report after about nine days in May 2016. That report, the minister couldn't submit to the president. He couldn't submit to the president because he didn't know what will happen to him after the service you have told him. Now, we have a situation where we have the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, who is Mr. President, who have extended his power of superintendence over the Armed Forces to the Honorable Minister of Defense. In American system, we understand that the Minister of Defense is the de facto Commander-in-Chief. If the President become uh, untenable at no notice, at short notice, or at no notice. So if they could intimidate the Minister, then it means they could do anything they want to do. So with the president not having access to information, that nothing you could do. In fact, a report written by a Washington-based organization said that the problem was that the president had been ring fenced from getting information about what is happening because of the limitless corruption in the leadership of the armed forces. And so that is a major problem for us. I'm going to interrupt for one minute. So if you could take about five more minutes, and then we'll move to the ambassador. Fine. Great. Now. Uh, for Nigeria and the global community, offenses must be punished as a way forward. For as long as we don't punish offenses, we cannot make any headway. Then, uh, from Nigerian point of view, Christianity is not acting as a religion. 
Christianity here, well, there are good Christians in Nigeria, I say it. But Khan, as the representative of, the, of, of, Christian, of Christians, is not acting as a religious organization. It's acting as a fraternity. So I actually was forced to find out what were supposed to be the objectives of Khan. What were supposed to be the teaching they imbibe from Christianity. So I went to the Bible and the word Christianity is not there. I said, this is not possible. So I contacted my friends whom I knew were learned Christians. The word Christianity is not in the Bible. So when I asked a friend, he said, but the word is in the Quran. I said, if the Christianity is not in the Bible, how could it be in the Quran? So I went to the Quran. Of course, I knew a little bit of the Quran. And that's the word Nasara, which the Muslim scholar overwhelmingly have been translating as Christianity. It's wrong translation. But the word Nasara is not even an Arabic word. That word occurs many places, but Quran chapter 5, verse 82 is critical. So, I had to go into research. What is the meaning of Nasara? Then I discovered that Nasara was not an Arabic word. So if you want to get the meaning of Nasara, we must go to the phrase, the phrase director, the phrase director that followers of Christ, God say, Alladina qalu inna Nasara. That followers of Christ who said, we are Nasara. So, I never go to Hebrew, I go to Aramaic. So I went into that, and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls assisted. The scholars of Dead Sea Scrolls encountered the word in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they couldn't interpret it. Now, the word Nazarene in the Bible has been misinterpreted by, by Matthew. Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 23. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2, verse 23 describe Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth and say that it had been predicted by an Israeli prophet. That prophecy doesn't exist anywhere in the Old Testament. The effort was to misinterpret the meaning of Nazarene, which is in the Bible today. The word Nazarene is there, and uh, from the Bible, biblical point of view, I think um, the Acts of the Apostle chapter 24, verse 5, is one of the areas we can go. Anybody who behaved like the Nazarenes, Christians who killed them. Paul was one of them. Paul's offense was that he was behaving like the Nazarenes. They saw Nazarenes as troublemakers. So, the scholars of Dead Sea Scroll saw Nazarene. But Nazarene is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, then they encountered an expression in the Dead Sea Scroll, which is Nosre Habri. Nosre Habre. What was Nosre Habre? They couldn't know. So they diversified their investigation and went to the Quran and see this word that God revealed to Muhammad وسلم, as Nasara is the same word as Nazarene. Then they went into the Greek translation which was wrongly rendered as Jesus of Nazareth. It's not supposed to be Jesus of Nazareth but Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus the Nazarene. So I pick on that and then discover that the city of Nazareth was established in the 4th century. In the 4th century. Could be there was no Nazareth. The names of the cities of Judea are mentioned in the Bible. Nazareth is not there. Paul wrote many epistles known to Nazareth. And the Roman uh, uh, map of, uh, of Judea, I think Rome was the colonial master, Nazareth was nowhere. The only place that was Nazareth on earth, using two very ancient maps, was in Iran, between the border with Iraq. So if Jesus was ever born in Nazareth, then he was born in Iran, like Daniel. So I came to a confusing conclusion. How is it that the word Christianity is not in the Quran? Which I have proved in the document, uh, a short treatise, when I have 100 copies, it's not here because of the logistic problem, but I will give them to Professor Molan to share to those who are interested. It's a short one, you can read it in one day, just uh, 20 pages or 40 quarter. So to establish conclusively that the word Nasara, by diction, by etymology, has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity is derived from Christos in Arabic. And I mean, it's wrong in Greek. And Christos was derived from Messiah in the Hebrew or Aramaic. And Messiah means Messiah in Arabic. 
Therefore, if there's going to be a word for Christianity in Arabic, it has to do with Masaha, which is Masihi. So uh, an Arab Christian would say it's a Masihi, not Nasara. Therefore, sir, I came to a conclusion which is very, very intimidating. And uh, I don't know how to put it. From the behavior of Khan, we were told by Professor, Professor um, Dauda Ojobi that he was part of the people that planned Metastine among the Northern Christians. We have seen the, the present, uh, the, 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 the immediate past uh, uh, president of Khan, Pastor Ayo Orisa Jafo, using an aircraft anonymously donated to him to go and import illegal weapons from South Africa. They have been doing it, but only once that God caught him, and that was frustrated. So if Khan was importing weapons, and to the extent that the Christian uh, diocese in uh, wrong, the, the Catholic diocese, the bishop of the Catholic diocese in Nigeria, came up to say that Khan was not representing the interests of Israel, and they suspended their membership, I think, from around 2012 to 2015 for as long as I or Risa Jafar was a member. So, sir, Christianity has been practiced in Nigeria as a fraternity. It's not a religion. Now, as a fraternity, they have the right to do whatever their organizational constitution provided to do, but they shouldn't be seen as opposition to Islam. Sir, this is what is happening, not only in Nigeria, but around the world. And I have come to the conclusion that this is the most primary source of insecurity globally today. Thank you, sir. Over to Ambassador Dan Lavina to, to respond and, and maybe ask some questions and then tell us a little bit about your experience um, covering Boko Haram as well or working on Boko Haram. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Uh, Dr. Deka, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Really comprehensive. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, wow. Thank you, sir. You covered a lot of territory, very thought provoking. Thank you, sir. Uh, when your book comes out, we're waiting for it. You've got to get it out. Thank uh, you, sir. I think it will generate a lot of reaction because you put some interesting uh, theses out there. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to focus my comments, and I'm going to be brief because the clock is ticking here, yes, sir. Uh, on uh, Boko Haram. Right. And I, I'm going to discuss how America perceives that issue. And uh, Naomi, in a very generous introduction, uh, pointed out that for 50 months, uh, I was the point person for the United States in, in driving American support for Nigeria and the other Lake Chad region countries in there yes, and, uh, in fighting uh, Boko Haram. Uh, so uh, I, I'm going to shift focus, and I'm, I'm going to narrow it back down to Boko Haram, uh, which uh, uh, is, is, of, uh, is where I, I've been working. Uh, I think one very important point is, and this complements uh, Dr. Adeka's presentation, yes, uh, Boko Haram did not drop out of the sky. Yes, so when America, your government, looks at uh, the problem of Boko Haram, we ask ourselves, where did this whole thing come from? How come in 2002, Mohammed Yusuf uh, and, and his ideas caught fire and spread like wildfire? across uh, Northeast Nigeria. And I, I'm going to uh, just uh, quickly go through these. Oh, I could expand on them, but like I said, the clock, unfortunately, is not being friendly. Uh, the success of Muhammad Yusuf in those early years is because he was tapping into deep-rooted frustrations in Northeast Nigeria for decades, for I would say centuries. The central government has <coughs> discriminated against the Northeast, has neglected the Northeast. Uh, uh, the local governance structures of the Northeast, civil government, the state and uh, local government, uh, traditional tribal governance, uh, religious governance, all failed, failed in the Northeast rotten, corrupt to the core. Um, you have abuses by the security forces that aggravated that problem. And those abuses are on, ongoing. Uh, 
uh, lack of investment in the Northeast, in the human infrastructure. Female literacy in the Northeast is less than seven, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven percent. Lack of investment in the physical infrastructure of the Northeast. Lack of economic opportunities in the Northeast. Deep poverty, lack of jobs, lack of livelihood. Surging population growth rate. Surging youth population. Fertility rate of over seven live births <coughs> per woman. Be staggered by that number. Replacement level is 2.1. Young men, throngs of young men with no prospects for marriage because of the needs of the local culture. Uh, you have the environmental issues of the Northeast, the shrinkage of massive Lake Chad, erstwhile massive Lake Chad. Why? Because water is being diverted from it for irrigation systems. Why? Because of the impact of climate change. <coughs> you have a history of violence in that part of the world. You have the influx of arms out of Libya, flooding out of Libya, that added to it. And then you have a religious element, the global jihadism, was a convenient thing to hook on to. You notice I put that at the end. And that's not by oversight. So uh, that's how we see the causes of Boko Haram. Now, it, now let me share with you my, my own experience in engaging with the Nigerians, especially the Nigerian <coughs> military, that be chief of defense staff, chief of army staff, the service leaders. When I first took up this job, February 2015, so I go hot putting it off to Nigeria. I need all these characters. They're wonderful people. But they, they, had a, they had a lecture for me. You, representative of America, we're telling you. First, of, first things first, we're going to wipe these guys out militarily. Then we'll come and we'll start to deal with social and economic and those kinds of issues. Very clear. And that was made in a uh, fora in uh, Germany in front of uh, representatives of, of European Union. Well, it wasn't just to me, it was very broadly said. That was a view. That has changed. And this is important. Now, uh, those same institutions under different leaders will look you in the eye and say, there is, and this is a direct quote, there is no military only solution to Boko Haram. That is a tremendous change. That is recognition. You cannot shoot your way to victory. Um, I'm going to just stop with that. And just quickly, I want to look at US engagement, in which I was appointed up until May 1st. May 1st, I retired. I have a very happy wife. Uh, <laughs> um, in 17, 18, and 19, America has contributed over one and a quarter billion dollars, your tax money or your parents, uh, to provide humanitarian assistance to the people Naomi talked about. 2.7 million people, as we said here, 2.7 mi million people in the Lake Chad region are not able to go to their homes. They're either uh, internally displaced or refugees. Around 10 million people have been directly impacted by the fighting of, of Boko, the activities of, of Boko Haram, people who've lost their livelihood. Um, so, in addition to the humanitarian assistance, we, America, have provided advisors to all four of these countries, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, Cameroon. We provided all the equipment, non-lethal, that Niger, Chad and Cameroon wanted. We provided, we are providing Super Tucano, a dozen Super Tucano <coughs> uh, aircraft to the Nigerian uh, Air Force. We provide intelligence on a continuing basis that we are collecting as we're all sitting here. We're collecting it 
with various uh, technical means, sharing it with all of our partners. We gave uh, Niger to, Chad to, and Cameroon to uh, Cessnas equipped to collect intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So we helped them develop their own uh, capacity. We provided Scan Eagle drones, these are massive things, uh, to uh, Cameroon so they can collect their, their own intelligence. Um, we have helped our partners develop DDR programs, uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration program to entice the fighters to come in off the battlefield, go through a de-radicalization process and return to their homes. We are ready. We, America, we, the international community, are ready to help the Lake Chad region countries, most especially Nigeria, stable, start to stabilize uh, this region. Start to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Start to create some sense of normalcy. And there are billions, with a B, dollars available to do just that. It's not happening. Why is it not happening? Because stable, uh, stable areas are, are, are not there. To have stabilization, you have to do what Naomi said when she was reading my introduction. You need success on the battlefield, and then you fill in behind that success with specialized police units, not the, the cops directing traffic in downtown Abuja. Specialized police <laughs> units who know how to function in a war zone, or near war zone. <coughs> Nigeria doesn't have those units. We uh, are working with Nigeria to create a pilot project to create those units. I'll be honest, ain't much happening with it. We don't have a very willing partner, I'll be honest. I'm not trying to be offensive. Uh, National Police Service has not uh, been too excited about creating that element. Uh, our uh, P3 partners, UK and France, are very much engaged as well. Uh, UK especially wants to engage with Nigeria. UK is especially frustrated, <coughs> as are we. America's frustrated uh, working with the Nigerian uh, military, which has, uh, uh, it, it, which is implementing a new uh, approach to this problem, which they call super camp. <laughs> Effectively, the army, I would put it, is giving up the countryside. Uh, and, and concentrating back, not even with forward operating bases. They've abandoned those, coming into just their main uh, uh, camps. Uh, it's a difficult situation. Uh, that said, uh, the Nigerian Air Force has been a very productive partner uh, for us. But it's not just uh, Nigeria that I would say, and the brigadier might uh, not agree, uh, I think uh, Nigeria ha is largely coming off of the, the battlefield. Has. This last dry season, for example, there was no major offensive. Every other one, I, would, I witnessed them, uh, they had major offensives. This time, uh, not. But you look at the other countries. Look, look at Chad. Uh, Chad has an existential threat coming from the north. So guess where in Jemena, the capital of Chad, guess where their focus is? It ain't Lake Chad region, which is the far south. Look at Niger. Niger, too, is directly, Niamey is a thousand miles away from the Lake Chad, but very close to Niamey uh, is, is, is a great threat to them coming out of the Sahel. The, uh, the Islamic State of the Greater, greater Sahel and the uh, Al Qaeda of, of the Maghreb. So their focus has shifted over there. Look at Cameroon. And I must say, Cameroon has some of the best fighters, but their focus has really shifted because they have what they call the Anglophone crisis. You know, uh, 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 Cameroon has is Francophone and Anglophone. And the, and the Anglophone districts are uh, in rebellion, that might be too strong, but in, in insurgency. So, Bia, the president of Cameroon, he ain't thinking about uh, Boko, and he ain't thinking about Lake Chad. He's focused 
on this threat to his country and his kingdom. So uh, all of that is to show uh, how the dynamics have changed. When I look at 2015, 2016, uh, there was so much cooperation. Pieces were coming together. I look at 2017, <coughs> it was getting more fragile. America's interest was shifting. In 2015, 16, Boko Haram was a flavor of the month. And I know it because every door in this city would be open. But that changed. You know, America. Sometimes we can be fickle, we, or we just have competing priorities, and we moved on. And Boko was a problem for yesterday. We got new problems today. Uh, so you see dialing back uh, of our engagement there as, as well. So that's where you are. Nigerian army uh, is, uh, is constrained by size. And, uh, you know, the posted size of the army, I don't know what it is, multiple hundreds of thousands, but the real size is less than a hundred. I mean real, as in people with boots on. Uh, not people collecting paychecks, I'm talking about boots. Uh, and in a country of 180 million people, in this turbulent part of the world, it is challenging. And the police, as I said before, but I'm going to underscore, lack the capability to deal with a challenge like this. And my last comment, because now I've gone on too long, uh, is I just want to note, we had a good discussion about the lexicon Boko Haram. I, I do think it's very important to know that the terrorists themselves hate that term, never call themselves Boko Haram. That was made up by others, and uh, I think uh, the, the good doctor suggested where that might have come from. But it's not used by the terrorists. Uh, they, have, they have a proper name for themselves. Um, so anyway, I'll stop at that. I, I think we'll all have good questions uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Odeka. I, I'm going to take advantage and ask one. I'm just dying to hear his response. <laughs> okay, stop. Uh, so Buhari, the president of the country, has declared victory in the Northeast. I used to keep count and I lost track. Uh, I think it's over a half dozen times. The chief of army staff declares victory. Uh, so it raises a question. What is victory? What does victory mean? What is victory in the Northeast of Nigeria against Boko Haram and its fellow group, uh, ISIS West Africa? What is victory? Uh, I'll leave that with Dr. Adeka, and you all have a bunch of questions. <laughs> thank you, sir. You want me to respond, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, like I told you, uh, one of the cardinal uh, policies of the current government from its first tenure is to root out uh, terrorism from Nigeria. And when they came in in 2015, like you noted, they worked hard. Out of the 70 to 80 local governments, that were under Boko Haram, uh, as handed over by President Gulag Jonathan, they were all recovered. But as I'm talking to you, about eight local governments have been taken by Boko Haram, using this policy of continuous defense under the cover of Supercamp. They have taken over about eight local governments. Nobody wants the president to know. So, the president is going to make a declaration based on what his service chiefs tell him. Now, I have witnessed that service chiefs don't want him to know the truth. So, president will declare victory in 2016-17. And probably still sitting here today that that victory is still there, but things have changed. That victory is no longer there. It's, not, it's humiliating to describe what is happening in that place now as you might have even read on the newspaper. So it's not the fault of the president. It's the fault of the military leadership. And the sponsors of Boko Haram, who are generally Nigerians, including former presidents, they keep tap on this thing. Some of the military leaders, most of the military leaders are their boys, or God's son, as we put it there. So that is where the problem is, sir. So what does victory look like to Nigeria? 
Well, what is, what is the, the people, victory means the enemy is no longer there. So at a point, even there were 17 local government under the, uh, the, the uh, Boko Haram Caliphate, the Islamic Caliphate before, and eventually you reclaim all those local government, that is an element of victory. But that has changed. It's now on and off, on and off, on and off. And like you say, you made a statement that you had good cooperation from the Air Force. That is not the same with the other people on the ground. <laughs> it's not the same, sir. The, 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 the Chief Army Service, my good friend, and uh, my immediate junior, but uh, we, we had our good side and the, the, the positive side and negative side because of this same issue. I have gone to him to give him ideas. Uh, yeah, some of those ideas will work, but uh, we has some other reasons why they shouldn't be applied. Sir, like you know, uh, we, 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 Commonwealth countries see it as a type of fire, interdiction. Interdiction, they see it as a type of fire. But uh, Calvin Week saw it as a principle of war. And that principle is that when you are fighting with an enemy that you can see, don't allow support for that enemy to come in. That principle was based on the conventional warfare where there is a battlefield, there is a forward edge of battle area, and there is death. So you block the death and prevent enemy from getting reinforcement. Now, if we now come to terrorism, which has no battlefield, can't we adapt that principle? I intend to write a paper on, first of all, convincing the Commonwealth country that interdiction is not a type of fire, it's a principle of war, then adapt it to suit uh, uh, fourth generation warfare. Now, how do we apply it to prevent the sponsorship? So there are active sponsors of terrorism. And one of these active sources are, 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 are identified, I have identified some of them. I can name them. I have named them in my books. So, you go after them. Because for as long, Boko Haram have been paid with hard currencies. There was an aircraft that came down, I think in 2014, with $6 million. Nobody died in the helicopter. The helicopter belonged to the Nigerian Air Force. It was going towards Boko Haram. What is it carrying $6 million to, to, to do in the Northeast? Now, it came down, of course, villagers will want to come and see what happened. So they set the $6 million on fire. Because how would they explain it? That Asuro is the one sponsoring Bukhana, which is what was happening throughout Jonathan's time. The belief was that the Niger Delta wanted to go on secession. Each time they attempted, 1966, 1990, the military element, particularly the rank element, will bring them to their knees. So if the North is sufficiently destabilized, they will be able to go away. So it is actually the country fighting against it itself for sectarian interest. I have written out this and I have talked to the people and I have told you some of the uh, 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 flashback I had. I nearly couldn't finish my PhD. So that is it, sir. The sponsors are there. So my recommendation is that the sponsors should be caged. For as long as they are not caged, Boko Haram will not go. In fact, it is a business. The military elements, leadership, are making a lot of things from there. That's why they didn't want me to go there, to investigate anything. So that is how far I can go on that, sir.